his whole philosophy behind Captain Planet and the Planeteers is how do we um, how do we engage kids around um, community resolution, around community benefit, and around the environment. And the cartoon really was structured as five average teenagers from around the world. They were from the five major continents, and they uh, banded together when they saw something in their community that needed fixing. So it was a really great empowering show, and the foundation continues that to this day. So you can see here that we've um, we've funded a little over 1.2 million youth directly through the grants that we've done in the foundation. We also um, have operating programs like Project Learning Garden, Project Endangered Species, and the Science and Environmental Education uh, programs for educators. So that's um, more focused um, specifically on K-12 and providing opportunities and space for learning. Um, and again, very place-based focused on environmental outcomes. And in the small grant categories, and you can find all of this on our website, which is captainplanetfoundation.org, um, you can see we, we really um, grant across all of the areas that you would expect to see in environmental education and environmental action. Um, and it really is about what does uh, an education leader and their team of kids see as being necessary in their community that needs to be addressed, and then um, and then we provide that uh, small grant funding between $500 and $2,500 per project to buy the materials, resources, and other barriers to um, being able to make that pro project come to life. And we have two grant cycles every year. Um, the first one um, uh, finishes at the end of September, and the second one finishes at the end of January. And you can go to our website and find um, those grants and those applications there. So, so on to the actual um, the trash track. Um, so the story of waste, I think, um, is important for the kids to understand. And that is, um, it, what do we do um, with the amount of refuse that our daily lives produce? Um, and what's fascinating about what's happening in the world today is that there's really very little that we use that can't move back into the um, back into the supply chain stream for other manufacturing uses, back into the supply chain stream to become again what it once was, um, or if they're organics, back um, into the soil to um, build topsoil and nutrient density for our foods. And that really has been um, an incredible journey over the, since the 1970s to not just discover what those opportunities are and build those business practices around those opportunities, but to also then educate a public who really was taught from school age that when you are done with something, you just throw it in the trash and it magically disappears, right? Which is um, is really how we've always sort of treated treated trash, um, and um, and as we now know today that that it's no longer the case, and we're finding less and less space for landfills and more and more need to diminish the um, the trash that actually goes into the ground because it causes all kinds of groundwater contamination, downstream issues, and pure, you know, issues of space. One of the other big major issues I talked about, watershed and downstream issues, and I'm sure you guys have heard a bit about this, is something called the five gyres. And the five gyres are areas in um, and around the globe in the oceans where the currents uh, operate in cycles, and those cycles cause this sort of vortex of circular movement, and into that vortex of circular movement, we um, see all of this trash that is being gathered. Now, the, the one on the right is sort of an extreme, that, that young boy in the boat is sort of an extreme version of that. There, obviously, there's a, a significant amount of, of that trash that if there was the, the cash and the facilities to do so, you could recapture that and get it out of the water. But what the gentleman's holding in the left in that jar is really more the issue of what we see um, happening around the globe, and that is that the plastics in particular break down into these tiny little microbeads almost, and microbeads that are in um, skincare uh, products just um, remain microbeads and move into the water uh, sheds and then into the rivers and then into the oceans. And those are very, very dangerous for the oceans because they 
They're about the size of plankton and they can fuse a lot of sea life. There are lots of impacts on wildlife. Up on the top left you can see a bird. This um, was actually found on the Galapagos Islands and this was the amount of plastic trash that was inside the bird at the time that it um, expired and probably the reason why it did expire. And all of that looks like food to that bird. It looks like berries and other types of food. So they don't know any differently and so it's just being consumed and ingested. And um, you can see a lot of sea debris like the um, fish netting, which, you know, since the beginning of industrial fishing, the solution to a net no longer being beneficial to um, a fishing vessel was to just dump it over 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 side over the side of the boat. Um, so there there's no real system for collecting and bringing that back. So you can see the impact on wildlife with the netting around the neck. Obviously, we've seen before the picture of the um, the turtles who, you know, when they're young get trapped and they simply um, continue to grow with that um, plastic around them, and it's so strong and durable that it doesn't break. Um, and then at the very bottom, one of the biggest issues that we're seeing now, and one of the reasons why you see a lot of uh, plastic bag bans happening, particularly in coastal communities, is that when they're floating in the sea, they look just like the jellyfish on the left. And so, so you can see the jellyfish and you can see the plastic bags. They look the same to a turtle, and jellyfish are what turtles eat. So there's been a huge issue with regards to um, endangering sea turtles because of the plastic bags that enter the seawaters. And so one of the big questions is, well, what do we do about all of that, and how do we, how do we stop it from entering the water? Um, and so we're going to talk about a couple of things today. One, we're going to talk about recycling. We're also going to talk about upcycling, and then we're going to talk about composting, which are three, the most three common ways that we take um, non-productive, um, post-consumer goods and um, keep them out of the landfill and keep them in the um, productive stream. So the first thing is recycling. Obviously, this is something that we've all become very um, accustomed to, and there's been a real interesting um, sort of split in the recycling communities between what we call source separated, which if you look along the picture on the right, you can see that there are separate bins for different types of recycling. So they're collecting um, metals in one, paper in another, plastics in another, cardboard in another, and glass in the fifth. So that's the most typical way that those are um, pulled apart. But the um, but what's happened is at in urban areas, what we normally see is something that's called single stream recycling, which means we put everything into one bin, send it to sorting facilities, who then pull it apart and figure out what can get used. Um, and that works okay for some of the recycling. It works not very well for the rest of the recycling. And there's a really high level of what's called contamination. Um, and once that contamination takes place, a lot of those goods end up going to the landfill. So, um, so it's really important for people to understand proper recycling protocols and to really understand what their area is able um, to do because a, a really big, you know, 10 million person urban area like Atlanta, Georgia, um, they can tolerate a lot of um, what, what would you know we call um, contamination, um, and they can um, they can they have people who collect all pulp, so all paper, all cardboard, all everything, even a pizza box that still has pizza leavings, you know, not a piece of pizza, but like you know the sort of gack on the bottom of the box, like they can take that and through the proper facilities with a company called Pratt Recycling, they can actually. Re, um, reclaim the pulp and reuse the pulp and it not be contaminated. But in other markets, they may not have that sort of sophistication. And once that um, cardboard, that stained cardboard box goes into the cardboard, it contaminates the whole load. So it's really, it's, I know that's confusing, but it's really important to, for kids and communities to understand really what are the capacities for their community and recycle appropriately for that, meaning that they may have to wash those cans out or just throw them bottles of old mayonnaise, you know, just throw it in the dishwasher when you're doing a load anyway, and so that you've got a clean bottle going into the recycling. And then there's also really interesting companies like uh, TerraCycle is, I, they're the only one I know who's doing this, but um, it was started by a Czechoslovakian man um, named Tom Zaki, who um, was going to school actually at Princeton, and he was 
fascinated by what was being captured in recycling and what wasn't and thought, gosh, there's got to be uses for almost everything that gets used. Like this, All this other stuff can't possibly be trash. There's got to be ways for us to put it back into productive use. And so he started a really, um, uh, now a multi-billion dollar company called TerraCycle that works predominantly with schools and other youth groups um, to collect the most common things that they um, that they use. So you can see in that um, box right there that's a collect and send box. Those are Capri Sun pouches. And those actually get turned into bags. You can see um, in the back of that picture on the right, that's a Capri Sun bag. Um, so those um, that metal has been put back to use um, as um, fabric. Um, and then the, all the rest of those plastics have been taken from other plastics that have been thrown away, whether it was coolers or other things, and, um, and put back into productive use. Um, there's another interesting company that has specifically um, figured out how to take plastic shopping bags and turn them into um, non-wood decking material that's um, super high durability and lasts for a really, really long time. And it's a great way to move those plastic bags out of the waste stream. Um, but Tom Zaki's group, I mean, they've figured out how to, um, how to recycle everything from um, cigarette butts to gum to hair nets. To, I mean, it's crazy. There's nothing that they haven't figured out how to pull down to its fundamental chemicals and move back into the processing stream. So it's a really awesome um, company. I would definitely recommend that you have your, um, your teams look into that. Um, but they can also, um, they can also uh, sign up with TerraCycle. They'll get free boxes and free postage. And then the schools or the youth groups get a percentage of what is collected back in cash. So it's a great way to fundraise and it's a great way to reduce waste um, at the local level. Are these items that are simply not cost effective to recycle in larger facilities? You know, larger facilities, um, they break the plastics down into the numbers and, um, and these don't fit those categories. So yes, that's exactly right. If, if what um, has the highest usage is um, gallon milk jugs, then somebody's going to figure out how to, how to get those in mass and put them to work. But it's the smaller um, chip bags and Capri Sun bags and um, uh, pens markers, you know, the plastic on the outside of the markers that you use in schools all the time, all of that stuff can become these hard durable goods that you see in the right hand side of this picture. Um, and the um, and that's what TerraCycle does is try to find a place and a, a company that uses that particular type of plastic. Um, so yeah, that's an excellent question and that's exactly why. Is this a viable service for international teams or are you aware of um, an equivalent for international teams? Paracycle is international. They, um, in fact, the gum recycling was a project out of Brazil because they apparently have a very um, a big culture of chewing gum and throwing it on the streets. And so they were trying to create a solution to all of the gum that was literally gumming up the, the communities. Um, so yeah, no, this is international. If you go to terracycle.com, um, definitely you can, um, you, you should be able to find a way to, to get collected. So the next thing that I want to talk about, which people don't really think about when they think of um, recyclables, is textiles. Um, and it, I have to say, I've been um, working for environmental groups for over a decade, and I still would, when I was going through my clothes, think, oh, that's got a stain on it. I'm not going to send that to Goodwill. They're not going to want that. And I chuck it in the trash. Well, how embarrassed was I when I found out that um, that all of those textiles can be also put down to their original fibers um, and reused in the productive stream, and that there is no good for that um, that the clothing going to the to the um, landfill. And in fact, when that clothing went to the landfill, because it is so highly compostable, meaning that it's going to break down fairly quickly, it off gases and contributes um, to um, to greenhouse gases. So. Um, so there is no, I'll say this with absolute certainty, there is no fiber containing product in your homes or in your businesses that cannot be reused, whether it's cardboard, a milk carton that's, you know, paper-based, regular office paper, your dog food bags, 
and textiles. Like all of that can be collected if you have a facility near you uh, that is that um, that is collecting that type of fiber. It can get collected and reused. Um, and the textiles is a really big one. So basically, if you think about um, the amount of um, textiles that get thrown away every year, there's a great statistic here. It's basically 11 million tons just in the U.S. alone, and that's the equivalent of 50 container ships worth of clothing, which is sort of an astonishing um, number. Only 15% of all unwanted textiles, including clothing or old sheets or old towels or washcloths or you know anything, um, uh, go actually and stay within the manufacturing stream, and the rest of them go to the landfill. So you can take them to Goodwill. You can take them to, you can take them to Salvation Army. Any place that has that does secondhand selling is probably collecting and reselling those collectibles that they can't sell, and they're going to resell them um, either to organizations that distribute them to um, to um, communities overseas that are looking for high quality, low cost clothing, or they're going to distribute them to companies who are going to take those. Um, those uh, fabrics, put them into a machine that's going to take them down to their original fibers and literally make clothes and shoes and things with them again. So, um, and then there's also people like RTM and other collection uh, boxes that like you'll see them at um, uh, targets or you'll see them at um, gas stations sometimes. We're starting a program here where we're trying to help RTM get them at schools because schools are uh, heavy producers of lost um, coats and things that at the end of the year just sort of have amassed in the offices and, and they often get thrown out. Um, so that those can get collected, but people can also bring those from home and just put them into those bins and then the benefit goes back to the school. So that's a really important thing to, uh, to talk to the teams about. Um, like I said, there's really no nothing that we use any longer that doesn't have a place to go if you're willing to do the research and find and find out where that is. And with people like TerraCycle and and other companies who are willing to let you box it and ship it and are willing to pay for that postage because the end use value of that is so high, it's a great thing for us to be able to limit our landfill use. Um, so back to the oceans, right? So everybody's all flipped out about them and they should be. This amazing young man who, um, he's um, from the Netherlands and at the age of 17, he invented a solution to plastic cleanup in the Pacific Ocean based on a biomimicry design of a manta ray. And so, um, and this device, he basically did a crowd raising um, program and raised over $3 million to build the first one, um, which was sort of extraordinary. I think his target was 700,000 or something. So, so, and it went so well that it, they ended up starting an organization called Ocean Cleanup that you can also find online. And so what, the, what this is, is it uses the natural currents um, to collect, and you can see where that, um, it collects the plastics all along these giant arms that are like the manta rays arms that go out in a large curve, and then it moves along um, into the main um, machine which sorts and dumps the, the plastic debris into that large container. The plan, the way that this is designed, is that those plastics will then be broken down back into the original chemicals that are oil-based products. So those, if you think of things like Vaseline or, um, or actually plastics, frankly, which need those oils to be made into um, a container, they're going to recollect these plastics, break them back down to those original chemicals, and sell them back into the industry. So that, um, one, we get the oceans cleaned up, two, we um, reduce the demand for oil, and three, they're able to build more of these to clean up the oceans more quickly. So it's a really interesting um, concept. It's the first one gets deployed this year. Everybody's sort of got their fingers crossed to see if it's actually going to work. It certainly has worked um, in beta, um, but you know, the oceans are interesting things. So we'll 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 see how, how that goes. Uh, but I think one thing that's really interesting about his approach to this is, you know, yeah, we can clean it up, but really we need to stop the plastics from going into the oceans in the first place. So I'm going to talk about a couple of, um, of young um, eco-heroes who have started organizations who are doing just that. You had mentioned RTM. Could you explain what that is for a moment? It's a company that um, collects. Now RTM happens to be um, for-profit 
and the reason why Captain Planet is partnering with them is because uh, a higher uh, volume of what they collect stays out of the landfills. Um, there are still, um, there, it's better than nothing to go to Goodwill and, and, um, and Salvation Army. They do a great job, but they do, at the end of the day, move some of that product back into the landfills. And so with RTM, we just feel a higher level of confidence that they're going to um, they're gonna get it right. This webinar is to kind of give your team a little bit of inspiration uh, about why this challenge topic is important and give some examples of, of young people making positive changes. Lisa was part of our challenge advisory team that helped advise us on our challenge and so we're, we're, we're hoping that this webinar inspires you to talk about your your possible avenues that your team could explore and, and also to get some inspiration from other um, other young people who've made changes. So we'll move on to Carter and Olivia Reese. Um, they um, have an organization called One More Generation um, which they started when they were um, seven years old and nine years old respectively. Carter is the male, he's older um, and um, and they originally um, started their organization because they were concerned about the plight of endangered species and they wanted to make sure that <clears throat> that all animals exist for at least one more generation. Um, and over the course of their sort of learning and understanding um, the, the issue of recycle of um, endangered species, they realized that there was, uh, there were things that were causing those declines and that perhaps um, the, the approach for them to take was to address the issues that were causing decline. So their particular um, issue was around plastic pollution and those entering the oceans um, and the waste streams and, and um, polluting the waterways. And so they actually, um, along with some partners, and you can see a giant group of partners there on the right, um, created a one week long curriculum that has gone into schools um, all around the southeast to date, but it's also now going into the U.S. and South Africa, and they have youth board members around the world who are um, working this year to bring it into Australia, Colombia, and China. And it is um, a really amazing um, program where um, all week long the um, students in the school are asked to bring any plastic waste from their household to the school and they start to pile it into a large um, haul-off cart that gets placed there at the beginning of the week. And um, it's quite extraordinary to see how much plastic gets used and produced by the families in just that one school in one week. And it's it's very eye-opening for the kids. It's very awareness-raising for the kids. And um, and then at the end of the um, at the end of the the week, they end up taking all of that plastic trash and turning it into a sculpture. So that's what you're seeing in some of those pictures. On the one on the right, they obviously made a map of the United States, and the one on the left, it's a sea turtle. But um, but it's a great way for them to begin to um, to think about what they're purchasing, what their parents are purchasing. Um, how to influence those buying choices so that they minimize um, the, the amounts of plastic that are coming into their lives, but then also that those um, plastics are recycled responsibly and not put into a stream that's going to cause issues down the road. So just amazing kids. They've also been working specifically with the government of South Africa and the government of um, Vietnam and the U.S. Embassy in Vietnam to deal with rhino poaching. Um, Again, looking both at the end user of rhino horn, which is the Vietnamese um, more than other countries, that tends to be a high use of rhino horn, um, and then the, um, the country that, um, that has the rhino as their indigenous animals, but also is um, concerned about it because it's a key to their tourism industries, and so it's a key to their GDP. So everything's connected at the end of the day to um, to economy, I mean, everything has to be, the economy and business has to be taken into consideration as all of these choices are made. What we advocate with the, the youth that we work with and what we really love about the groups today is that I'm talking to you about today, and I think this is one of the things you can really help your teams understand is it's really about consideration and um, innovation so that um, at the end of the day you're doing no harm but you're not and that also means no harm to economy or opportunity so those two things are not mutually exclusive and that's one of the greatest 
things that we can um, that we can share with you today is that there are solutions to what we're dealing with. We just have to get on board with them. We have to innovate. We have to think of them. And so this will be a great um, opportunity. This will be a great challenge for your teams. Um, the next um, uh, youth crusader I want to tell you about is a, a, a young boy named Milo Kress. He's from Vermont, um, and he started a, um, a movement when he was just nine years old. Um, he was in a, a, a restaurant that he and his mom went to all the time um, in Burlington, and, um, and he realized that every time they brought him a soda pop or a water, there was a straw in it, and he just thought that was so strange because he didn't really use the straw, and he didn't understand why they thought he needed a straw. And he began to do some research, and he found out that the, the number of straws that get used each day um, in the U.S. alone is over 50 million straws. And it's enough disposable straws to fill over 46,000 large school buses per year. And that just blew his mind. So he started this, um, this project called Be Straw Free. And what he said, he's, he's adorable. You should totally have your teams Google his talks online because he's really one of the most um, dynamic and, and adorable presenters I've ever seen. Um, is uh, is, uh, you know, I'm not the straw police. Like, if you want a straw, I'll use a straw, but shouldn't I at least have the option? Like, can you, we just teach restaurants to offer first? Can we just ask me if I want a straw or put them on the table so I can take a straw if I need one and not just assume that every time you bring a drink to my table that there needs to be a straw in it? Um, and so he has presented to the National Restaurant Association. He is partnered with the National Park Service so that they have an offer first policy. And they're now starting off with first policies in Malaysia, Canada, and South Korea. So that is also taking off. And it's, um, I mean, these kids are just amazing. And what's great is that with social media and with globalization, it's, it's you know, not too far to go to begin to get youth in other countries to join on board so that it can spread quickly and have deep impact. So, um, so Milo is, um, he's amazing. And, um, and I definitely think that he'll be, and that seems like such a small thing, but, you know, you think about 500 million straws a day going to landfills, breaking down, and going into waterways, and it's, you know, a big part of the problem at the end of the day. Um, the next group is um, uh, a group called, actually, the Planeteers in Ghana. Um, they all grew up on the um, television show, and as they became young adults, they banded together to, to, um, to do beach cleanups. Um, cleanups in um, Accra, and also to do beautiful murals across the city, teaching their communities about proper disposal because it was not happening. Everything was just going to the ground, very much like the United States before we began the um, the no littering campaigns back in the 70s. Um, and so um, they're just an amazing, passionate group who has really. Um, changed the, the face and the experience in Accra in, with regards to waste. So they're a great um, um, group, too, that I think I'm really um, impressed and passionate by their, their commitment and their work. So, so that's recycling, right? So the other thing I want to talk to you guys about is upcycling, because I think your teams will get really interested in this, too. So the difference between recycling and upcycling. So recycling is really um, the collection of materials that will most likely remain that same type of material, right? So we are collecting aluminum cans, predominantly because they're going to become future aluminum cans. We're collecting um, metals uh, in the um, form of cars and other steel products because they're going to go back into the production of steel, right? Metals awesomely are infinitely recyclable. You can recycle aluminum a thousand times and there is very little regenerative loss on the um, aluminum. Same thing with other metals. Plastics, you know, there's sort of a lot of them are going to become plastic bottles again, but they're also going to become other plastic type materials or they're going to become chemicals that are used in, you know, for plasticizing or, or um, other similar uses in the manufacturing um, stream. Paper is going to become paper again, right? So recycling, we're basically going to just keep it in the stream to become itself again. Upcycling is really about a non-traditional use of something that cannot be recycled. So on the left, those are spoons. 
that have been um, hammered flat and bent, and then they each have a name, so that's at a schoolroom, and each child has their own spoon hook, so that's awesome. The, the next one is clearly light bulbs that have been used as little um, flower vases. The one on the right is a pallet that's become a desk, um, a tire that has become a play bench. Um, the um, thing hanging in the middle, that's an old um, uh, stoplight. So that's both the, in, the insides and the um, actual glass that covers the lamp. Um, that's become a bird feeder on the left. We've got an Adirondack chair that's made out of skis. And then in the bottom you can see these are you know, similar to what TerraCycle has started and a lot of companies have taken this off now where you can get bags that are made from previous Oreo bags and containers and Capri Sun bags turning into backpacks and things like that. So that's upcycling. It's taking something and using it for something new. And this is an amazing thing for kids. They are infinitely creative and they come up with the coolest and um, later you think the most obvious stuff. Why couldn't I think of that? But we just don't have the same elastic brains that they do. And they just, this is a great project for the kids and it could be a really fun thing for this, um, for this upcoming challenge. Um, this is another example of upcycling. So this is a, actually a grantee of ours in the Philippines, um, and they did something that's called bottle blocks. So this was a children's home and school um, in the Philippines on one of the smaller islands, and they had a lot of um, soda and water bottles coming onto the island, and they had no way to get them removed again. There was not there's clearly there's not recycling, and they didn't have great trash. Um, uh, pick up. So they went online, the kids um, at, the, um, at the school went online and did some research and they found this technology that was being used in South America and in Africa called bottle blocks where they take old liter bottles and they fill them, stuff them to capacity with um, non-recyclables or non, I'm sorry, compostables, so like hard plastics or sand and it becomes almost as strong as a brick. Um, actually, they say it's stronger than a brick. On this first slide, they're clearly doing decor along the garden paths, but here they become a building material, and um, they are, um, they're durable. They don't break down, as we know, because we've seen that happening in our landfills where we know it's going to be thousands of years before those bottles have even begun to uh, break down. Um, they, um, they are insulating. It's a really cool way. So what this particular grantee did was they built an eco center and they left the walls exposed so people could learn about this construction technique and a way to reuse that debris. Um, this is another great reuse of soda pop bottles. You'll see a lot of this issue because it's one of the most ubiquitous things that has left the United States and gone global and it's you know a major uh, concern and issue with regards to the amount of debris that it's creating. Um, and so this is a, an amazing um, program. It's now part of a group called My Shelter Foundation, but it was created by a student um, who was from the Philippines and he was at MIT and he had gone back home and he was trying to figure out like in the, um, in the poorer areas of the city where they didn't have um, electric run, how could they get light into the homes during the day to, so that they could um, have safer um, places for the kids to study, they could have safer places for the women to do um, cooking and housework and not rely so much on, um, on the burning of fuels that were causing a lot of upper respiratory issues. And what he designed and figured out was that if you take a regular old liter bottle and you fill it with water and just a tiny bit of chlorine, that for five years it will not absorb any algae or anything. And then you can, you glue that the top back onto the bottle, you affix it to a small piece of, um, of that metal roofing, you lay that small piece of metal roofing um, on top of the existing roofing and seal that with this rubber cement and you end up with this refracted light that has the strength of a 40 to 60 watt bulb that lights the house. And um, it's been really amazing. Their goal is to have a million of these in place by 2020. Um, they, by 2013, they already had 15,000 and they were just getting started. 
Um, and you can see on the left how many countries have now adopted and are beginning to do installations. The amazing thing about this, though, is that My Shelter was created because they realized that the cost of this um, in most developing countries was less than $5 per light, and so they could crowd raise that so people could just at a pop buy 500 of these for a uh, community, um, which is something fairly simple to do from the West and make a huge difference and all of the installation and all of the work gets done by locals and so it becomes economy to them, it becomes jobs to them, it becomes way to earn a living to them. So it's a really cool, um, again, youth-based solution. And then finally, my last one is this amazing um, young man named Richard Tarir, um in Kenya who his family, they're, um, they're uh, cattle herders um, and he his job when he got into his early teen years was um, to guard the herd from predation of lions and he realized that the lions were spooked by moving light and so he figured out how to um, how to um, how to run electricity which is sort of interesting, but he uh, two LED lights that he put up um, powered by an old car battery that was um, powered by a solar panel that was in their village. And so, um, and it worked. And then he went around to the villages around them in order to teach them how to do it too so that they could stop killing the lions and the lions could stop killing their herds. And it, it was highly successful. He ended up speaking at a TED conference in 2013. Um, and ended up getting a scholarship to Brookhouse International School. Um, but he, um, it's another great example of upcycling and solution making that comes out of a young mind. So I just wanted to offer that out because I thought it was just a great, a great example of innovation and reuse of materials. And then finally, composting. I think, um, you know, all what, what, what in the industry is called organics, right? So it's all food waste. Um, Right now, if you look at most municipal areas, 15 percent fully, 15 percent of what goes to the landfills is uneaten food and food waste. Again, it composts and it causes off-gassing at a much earlier rate than the landfills are prepared to capture that methane, um, so it contributes to um, greenhouse gases. Um, but more importantly, um, it is the foundation of healthy soil, and healthy soil means healthy, nutritious food. So it is in our high and best interest to return those foods to the soil and let it be the nutrition that feeds us. Um, and so composting is very simple. I just have some examples here. You can buy composters that speed it up. What you need to compost is heat and um, moisture. Um, or you can just, like you see on the top um, picture on the left, string some pig wire and, and off you go. You just start adding stuff into it. It's a mixture of green waste, being food scraps, and brown waste, which are carbon-rich things like leaves or straw or cut grass. Um, and that combination um, will break down into this beautiful soil that you can see at the bottom right. There's also a picture there of... Um, of vermi uh, vermiculture, which is worm composting. They um, compost at a much higher rate and they produce a really uh, highly nutritious um, uh, soil additive and um, liquid that just makes plants go completely nuts and produce an incredible amount of yield, again, with high nutritive value. Um, there's really no foods that can't be um, composted in a just even a schoolyard or a home compost except you don't want to put any proteins or or um, or um, animal-based fats in there, but otherwise anything goes, um, and it's um, pretty extraordinary how quickly it will break down into soil. Um, so that's another great way to reduce waste. We did have a, a question from the audience about the term off-gassing. Yeah. Um, if you could take a yeah. minute and explain that. Yeah, sure. So, um, so when um, when uh, waste decomposes, it produces gases, um, and most commonly, what we um, what happens now in the landfills is that they are um, that gets captured. It's methane primarily. It gets captured, and it actually gets uh, moved into the energy stream. So, when you 
um, have gas powered stoves or um, or uh, heat at your homes um, that can often be coming from sources that are being collected at your local landfill. Um, but the landfill, the way that they're um, they're structured um, and the way that their um, their business schedule runs, there's a certain number of years once it's been um, covered and capped that they expect that um, land to begin producing methane at a high enough rate that it is um, financially feasible for them to collect it. And so uh, what happens with um, things that are highly compostable and um, and that break down at a faster rate than what you would expect the other parts of the landfill to break down at is they go ahead and release their gases uh, uncaptured. And so that's what off-gassing is. Um, there's also off-gassing from um, furniture if it has, which is totally different, but it's similar in concept. Like if you buy um, a, um, a piece of furniture that has been treated with flame retardants or has um, used formaldehyde in its manufacturing process, there will be a period of time up to a couple of years where that furniture will off-gas that formaldehyde or those, um, those aspirant chemicals. Um, into your living area, right? So um, that's why in when you hear about like um, green homes or green buildings, ones that are really highly efficient and have been um, sealed as much as possible to stop airflow and exchange, they are really picky about the furniture and the furnishings that come into that space because they don't want off-gassing because it's not going to be, it's not going to move out of the building as rapidly as it would in a uh, a building that's not as well built and sealed, you know, that's going to have a lot more air exchange happening. That's going to be less efficient. That's probably more than you wanted to know. <laughs> um, I think the last picture is um, some pictures of our some of our learning gardens and all of the amazing yield that comes. Our schools do compost. Uh, you can see some of the amazing food that's coming off those gardens at the schools. Um, and you know, that's these are all all these gardens are um, are are run without inputs, meaning no fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, of course, they're using compost and other natural fertilizers, um, and with no um, uh, chemicals to prevent um, bugs and um, other pests. The, the greatest um, guard to a plant against pests is um, good health. Um, pests tend to attack unhealthy plants as a rule. That doesn't mean that they won't attack a healthy plant too, but as a rule, they tend to go after the ones that are struggling. So if the soil is good and the, um, and the plants are growing strongly, they tend to be able to fend for themselves fairly well. So that's a great picture there. And then I think we're at questions. So I'm happy to open the floor out. I threw a lot at you guys, um, but hopefully it'll sort of seed um, uh, your fertile brains with um, with fun projects for this challenge and for your teams. You mentioned that our students should really think about consideration and innovation, specifically consideration of doing no harm to economy or innovation, and they're looking for a little bit more information about that. Yeah, so I would say, you know, when you are um, innovating or when you're thinking about um, about um, when you're when you're making choices that uh, about what you're going to do with refuse or or what you could do um, with uh, refuse then um, or solutions at all you have to um, you have to have sort of, you need to take a lot more things into consideration than just um, what is the bottom line solution going to be so what are the what are the unknown costs that are going to be the downstream issues both literally and figuratively. And I think the earlier that kids understand that, the, the better they become as business and policy leaders later in life. And, you know, there's also, you know, the, the, you know, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and that happens, a lot of it even happens in the social and environmental community. I heard a story last year about a, a group that wanted to um, try to prevent malaria, and so they had given a... Um, a community malarial nets, but they, that particular community happened to live on the shores of a giant lake, and so the men of the community took those malarial nets and turned them into fishing um, nets, uh, and they overfished and basically um, uh, eradicated and polluted the food source because they polluted the water with all the chemicals that were in the nets, 
you know, but it, it never occurred to the company that was that was contributing those. They were trying to do something really great to consider what 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 could go wrong here. You know what I mean? Like how could this how could this go sideways? And I think that that's a really important question um, that we ask when we can and that we consider when we think about trying to have an impact, whether it's a business impact or a community-based impact. So that's all I'm talking about when I talk about consideration. Great. Um, some folks were really inspired by all the pictures of the gardens and the composting. And um, I have a question that's asking, do you know of a school district that has the, the best model for composting? I don't. I mean, they're all, they're all over the place, honestly. Um, and depending on the facilities people and depending on how that school district operates, they're going to have wildly varying policies. You know, um, we've had school districts who will let us have these types of open containers, like you see in the, uh, like you saw in the top left um, of that wire. You know, that was just surrounding the compost, and and um, and we have had others that have said, no, it's got to be closed and locked. We don't want, you know, it to attract pests. Uh, it's pretty um, pretty differing. Uh, we have other school districts. I believe the the school district in Denver, Colorado, has been approaching cafeteria based composting, which is pretty large scale and really interesting. So we've got our eye on that to see if if they're able to to get that done in a way that doesn't drive the facilities folks completely batty. Um, but um, there are ways around all of this. It's just a matter of building a system that works for all parties. So, you know, I think for any school at the beginning, it's important to have your facility team, your leadership team, and the kids all sitting at a table and figuring out what are the non-negotiables and what are the rules going to be, and then come up with a design that uh, meets everybody's needs, expectations, and, and outcomes. Are there any examples of how to incentivize people to do a better job of throwing their trash into the proper recycling containers? For example, at home people probably aren't very good at placing recyclables into the recycle bin. How can this be improved is a question and, and they're also wondering are there examples that you know of of how that's been improved? Yeah, I mean there have been a couple of companies um, and nonprofits that were created on a um, it was like a, an incentive basis, exactly what you're talking about. So, and even the city of Atlanta tried to do this, um, where the if you were part of the program, you would get rated um, if you were recycling the right things. And after, and the I guess that the waste teams were um, ballparking your um, the load waste. Um, and when you hit a certain amount, you got bounce back incentives like movie tickets or discounts to local restaurants or stuff like that. But what they found, interestingly, is that it didn't change anything. Like er Everybody thinks that an incentive program, the city of New York tried to create an incentive program. It didn't work either. They think that an incentive program is going to be the thing that, um, uh, that causes people to recycle more. I think, you know, we've seen from several examples that are several cities that have tried that 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 it, it it's not it, it doesn't really move the needle. Um, the bigger issue is understanding, I think, um, being able to teach the kids early on impacts. You know what we were taught when we were kids is that trash goes in a trash can, not on the ground. Which is why, as living in the year 2015, we don't see that much trash on the ground comparatively to what we would or what we had before we were really taught that, you know what I mean? We were also taught that when you get in the car, you put on a seatbelt. So it's a matter of education and habit building more than anything else, I think. Um, what we do know is kids who are taught that way um, go to their neighbor's houses, and when they see somebody at the neighbor's house throwing a, um, a soda pop can or an aluminum can in the trash, they pull it out immediately and say, where's your recycling? Like, what are you doing? So so I think it's really about education and habit forming um, is, is, is the way that it, it, it gets done. We've got a couple folks agreeing with you saying everything is about changing behavior and education. We have a coach who's looking at touring a landfill and a refuse to waste facility with her team. And she's wondering, are there certain questions you would suggest the team ask? Ask them where the hard plastics go. Um, that's been one of the big um, issues for America. You know, we've done a, an amazing job 
for the most part, of starting to get people to um, recycle plastics, but we don't always have a solution for them. And for the longest time, we were bundling um, and shipping in large containers over to China and saying, you figure out what to do with this stuff. And um, they basically stopped accepting the ships <laughs> at a certain point. Um, I don't know if that's been resolved. I haven't uh, talked to anybody about that in the last year or so. But um, but it's a good question. The hard plastics are the, are the difficult one. And, and they're also among the hardest to break down. Um, you know, when they get into the landfill, like they're just going to be there for ever. Um, so um, that would be a really great question. Um, and then I'd also ask them what did they ha what sort of objections did they have to overcome from the community, if any, so that the students begin to understand that just because you want to do the right thing doesn't mean it's going to be easy to do. And how did they overcome those objections? Those are all we get that with composting. Commercial composting facilities get shut down all the time because people don't want something like that around them. You know, um, and that's you know, it's um, it's unfortunate and it's uh, uninformed, and so you just gotta work around that and work with the communities to make sure that they understand um, that it's not going to be it's not going to be pollute, pollution building uh, or smelly because most compost facilities don't smell, frankly. What about electronic waste? Um, there's a great uh, website that EPA runs that helps communities find places to um, to put e-waste. E-waste, you know, it is, you're right, it's a big issue. There's a ton of it. People are buying, getting new phones every year, and then it's like, what do they do with the old phones? Um, the thing that's important about e-waste, about recollecting that, is that there are a lot of highly mined and very precious metals that are used in electronics. And much like the metals that are infinitely recyclable, those can get infinitely captured and reused in future electronics. And we do better as a globe and as a community of global citizens if we're not um, mining for those as much as um, recirculating those metals in in the marketplace. So, um, so that that um, if you go to EPA's website and um, and, or even Google um, EPA um, e-waste, um, they'll it'll pop up the the way that you can search for something some place near you that captures it. Um, most of the Best Buys now are accepting e-waste. Um, if you have a Keep America Beautiful um, chapter near you, which they are just ubiquitous across the United States now, they tend to have Saturdays every month um, in um, in urban and suburban areas where they have collection sites for that, um, usually once a month on a Saturday, where you can bring what's called hard to recycle materials, so paints, um, household chemicals, e-waste, batteries, all of that stuff that you're not quite sure what to do with. We have a coach who's wondering if you can share uh, any techniques to emphasize the concept of reduce in reduce, reuse, recycle to their teams. Yeah, I mean, reduce is, is um, that's the starting point, isn't it? It's not always the easiest one for people to adopt, frankly. Um, but but that was what the, um, you know, the Reese kids with One More Generation, the point of that, collecting all of that plastic was to demonstrate the sort of unconscious consumerism that leads to that amount of plastic debris being generated by a single school in a single week and helping the kids begin to extrapolate out, well, what does that mean for a year? And what does that mean if we're one of 109 schools in our district and one of, you know, 10,000 schools in our region? And um, so, um, so I think it's those kinds of letting the team, letting the kids' imaginations run wild with what the amount that gets generated that makes them begin considering how they're purchasing choices or how they can influence their parents' purchasing choices so that less of that comes into the household and therefore less of that has to be dealt with. But I'm telling you it's a hard one because we package the bejesus out of everything in this country in particular um, and other countries have followed suit. Um, there are uh, companies and organizations that have done a fantastic job of really pushing back on the manufacturing waste stream to say uh, you know, produce less packaging, that, that all can be done smaller, less, you don't have to put eight rounds of plastic around something, but um, it's a big issue, it's a very big issue, and it's a very hard one, because you're, now you're asking parents to go from 
buying a handy box of cereal to buying it in bulk, and then they got to figure out like how then what I have to bring to the store. It's it's an interesting and difficult transition. There's about 10% of the population that will make that transition easily, and the rest of them sort of slug along. We have a coach who's wondering, is single stream recycling better for the environment or better for the recycling company? Single stream recycling has increased the amount of recyclable materials that are currently being captured. But whether or not all of those are ultimately um, usable and um, don't go to the landfill is the big is the big question. And I would say different facilities with different capabilities have different outcomes on that. So you can have some facilities that just are able to do an extraordinary job with single stream and and really capture the majority of that, get it sorted. Make you know get the can contamination load knocked down and get it back into the into the manufacturing stream. You have other facilities that they're capturing single stream and you know 15% is um, is actually ending up back in the manufacturing stream and the rest is going to the to the landfill. So it um, the the very best case for recycling is um, is sorted, but um, that was what we tried to do through the 70s, 80s, and most of the 90s, and had again that sort of 10 to 15 percent of the population who was willing to do that, um, and the rest were just like, eh, it's too much trouble, or I don't have room for eight bins, you know what I mean? So, um, so that's when single stream came along, and it it definitely has increased recycling, but whether or not it's ultimately better, I I, I can't answer that. Hope that the industry gets better at the sorting and, and reuse of those materials. Yeah, we had a question from a coach who has heard that Japan is doing a great job recycling and wondering if you are able to comment at all and what the U.S. might be able to learn from them. You know, I had heard that too. I would have to do a little more research. I also heard that Sweden has gotten to where they're um, recycling um, or composting 99% of their waste. Um, it's doable. You know what I mean? I think... A lot of it is about how the packaging comes into the household and then obviously how the packaging goes out of the household. You know, Japan is an island and um, most of the island nations are a lot better at this than we are. We are a, a, a country with large land mass and so we just assume we can just dig another hole and bury this stuff somewhere else. It's just not true any longer. I, I would not be surprised about that. I think it's a really excellent research project for the teams to find the nations that are doing this the best and what are those processes and then is there a way for them to influence their local communities to adopt some of that or their school or even their block or their house you know um, I mean, all change starts uh, hyper local so um, if somebody could get back to me if your team comes up with an answer to that I would love I would love to see it the last question I wanted to get out there was um, from Marina, who's been waiting very patiently, and she said she was surprised to find out that waste management in her city is a for-profit system. How do we as a team even begin to tackle the mindset of a whole city to be on par with leading zero-waste cities from other parts of our country who have different mindsets in politics and leadership? Yeah, I mean, the best way that, um, that I've seen that done is by um, not trying to sort of um, tackle the whole thing at once um, and cities that have been the most successful that I'm aware of have started with something called a zero waste zone and so they'll go and they'll find an area downtown that um, has a high number of like hotels or um, restaurants um, and businesses and see if they can get that group to agree to um, go for zero waste and then um, and then they publicize the heck out of it and the great thing about teams of youth is that they're wonderful on camera and, and the media loves to cover them so um, so they should take advantage of that like the Reese kids are funny because they're like you know the great thing is we've got the cute factor so everybody wants us on TV or on their show the downside is that when we go to a corporate meeting and really try to talk brass tacks, they, they don't think we know what we're talking about and we have to sort of overcome that barrier. But they can absolutely get the PR going and that's what those companies are looking for. They're looking for how do we distinguish ourselves in the marketplace so that we do better business. So if you can convince a hotel that 
you know, that you're going to promote the heck out of them for being a zero waste hotel and all of the things being equal. Um, people are people who are interested in that's increasing. Even companies now are requiring that their um, employees stay at um, at hotel chains that have shown a substantial uh, movement on sustainability, and they can research that too. Marriott is one of them. The International Hotel Group that has the Intercontinental Hotel is one of them. So there are there are chains out there that have um, really embraced an opportunity to transition, and if you can get one of those as your anchor, and then build a little pocket around them and call that a zero waste zone in your town or in your city and get the publicity up around that, others will follow suit. And that's what happened here. So we've got whole districts in the city here who have done it, and I've, I've heard of that happening in other areas as well, because the Atlanta model was based on other cities. Excellent. Well, I, I want to take a moment to, to thank everybody um, today. Um, specifically, thank you, Lisa, um, for your fantastic stories and, and great tips. And, and thank you so much to the audience um, for chiming in with such great questions. And also to any coaches and teams who may end up watching this recording, um, we hope this will be really helpful and inspiring to you. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank our global First Lego League sponsors who help us bring the First Lego League Trash Trek season to life this year. They are 3M and I, Rockwell Automation, and of course, the Lego Group. Thanks again, Lisa, for the great discussion and food for thought. And thank you so much to our coaches and team. Good luck and have a great season.